Hi everyone, welcome to this session of Demo Fest, uh, digital whiteboarding for pre-sales uh, with John Kerr. Demo Fest is hosted by Consensus. We help pre-sales teams to scale with intelligent demo automation. Just as a quick note, we are recording this session and we'll be posting the links for the recordings in about two weeks in the Scaling Pre-Sales and Sales Engineering LinkedIn group. So we encourage you to join that group. And I'll paste a link to the group right in the chat window in a minute or two, as well as at the very end of this session, just so you, that, you have that for reference. John is the author of the highly successful book, Mastering Technical Sales, the Sales Engineering Handbook. Uh, the book has been described as the ultimate how-to manual for pre-sales engineers and their leaders, and is now an integral part of new hire development at many technology companies. To date, over 35,000 students have been trained in his professional skills curriculum. So we're excited to have him here, and without further ado, I'll hand it over to your presenter for this session, John Kerr. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate the introduction. And good morning or good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to visual selling or e-whiteboarding for the sales engineer. I want to welcome you. Whoa, there we go. Uh, I want to welcome you from Longboat Key, Florida, which is where I am situated. Um, so this is the view that I have out of my patio window. And if I was a really smart sales engineer, uh, I would actually be have my video set out there so you could see this. Um, you'll also notice this bunker, and this is typically where my golf balls uh, end up. So uh, that is Longboat Key, Florida. Not sure where most of you are. Uh, all right, so this is me. I'm John Kerr, Managing Director, Mastering Technical Sales. Uh, you can also see me on video. I'm not going to get into a big introduction about me. Um, this is all about you and the lost art or the fine art of whiteboarding, um, both physically and virtually. <clears throat> so today we're going to look at three main things around visual selling, we'll call it. Um, the first one being, why do it? And the answer to that is money and attention. Uh, the second thing we're going to look at is how to do it. And we're going to do a super quick review of a just a few best practices and basic rules, uh, really just as a taster or an appetizer to get you interested. And then lastly, we'll talk about a few next steps, uh, other resources and homework uh, that you can go look at if you're interested in learning more about this topic itself. So to get us started, um, little story about this fella. Um, he's actually one of my heroes, an unlikely hero, uh, Professor Charles Balin, or Chuck, as he likes to be known. And Chuck is a professor of astrophysics at Yale University. Um, you know, not the typical uh, setup for a sales engineer, um, but Chuck goes around the world teaching astrophysics at a number of different uh, levels. So he teaches at the undergraduate level, the postgraduate level, and at least in the old days, uh, pre-pandemic, he would do guest lectures around the world, um, Stockholm, Sweden, Sydney, Singapore, you name it. Now, astrophysics is an incredibly complicated topic. It's about black holes, quarks, 14 billion years of history, dark matter, and a whole bunch of other highly technical things that even we as sales engineers probably don't understand. Yet the reason that Chuck is my hero is quite simple, is that he can explain all of this using this piece of technology that you see in front of you. Uh, for the grizzled veterans out there, uh, this is probably giving you flashbacks and nightmares. Uh, for the younger sales engineers out there, you have, may have no idea what this actually is. Uh, it's an old visual transparency. And you'd put sheets of paper on top of the projector use those four pens on the right hand and start drawing. But back to the hero, um, why is Chuck a hero? Well, if Chuck can explain astrophysics using this technology and a few handouts, there's no reason why you can't, either with a physical pen or a virtual pen, explain a teeny tiny piece of your portfolio to your customer without resorting to a demo or a whole mass of PowerPoint slides. And that's really what the day is all about. So we're going to start off with why do it? Uh, money and attention. So two things here. <clears throat> First of all, we're engineers. We love data. So a little bit of data for you. We had a client a few years back and they had a problem. 
And their problem was they got an initial meeting with an executive, but couldn't get a follow-on meeting. And so my organization went in, we looked at what was happening, and we discovered they were literally killing their clients with PowerPoint. So we introduced some visual selling into their sales motion, and then went back and measured what happened. And here's what happened. Um, on the left-hand side here, we broadly categorize the three types of people in the class. So there are people who went through the class and said, eh, this is not for me. People who went through the class and said, I may be able to use this in a few places. And some people who fully embraced the program. Then if you look at the numbers, the people who are invited back to meet with the same exec, 32% for those who did not use visual selling and 72% for those who did. So an over two to one improvement. The next column, introduced sponsor to other parts of the client's organization, went from 36% to 59%. So pretty significant rise there. Percent of clients who wanted a copy of the whiteboard, 80%. Percent of clients who wanted a copy of the PowerPoint, 15%. We then went back and asked those clients, did you actually open the PowerPoint? And 0.02% of them opened the PowerPoint. So the bottom line is right there on the bottom of the screen. And it says the people who embraced the program had a 31% better quota attainment. So that is the overall beauty of visual selling. It's a purely tactical tool in that it's not something that you need to do all the time, but it is something that you should do when appropriate. All right, so Brian, I think this is where we stop the share and then go over to my iPad. Yep, great. Okay, so we will stop the share. I will share my content. We'll start the broadcast. We can see it. Hey, magic, okay. So why should you do it? Let's look at a typical sales call and what happens. So of course, I'm gonna explain this visually to you. This is a 60 minute sales call. So 60 minutes down here on the bottom axis and on the Y axis, we're going to look at the amount of attention that the customer is actually paying to you. Awesome. So what typically happens is customers pay a lot of attention to you at the start of the sales call. So it's pretty close to 100%. And at the end of the sales call, that's pretty close to 100%. And if you're any good at it, you get about five to seven minutes at the front end, five to seven minutes at the back end. So yeah, not too bad. Now, if you think about what's typically covered in here, it's intro, corporate overview, and who's typically speaking? It's the rep. And at the end, you might have some Q&A and maybe some next steps. Now, it's what happens in the middle that's really interesting. If you look at it, it turns out that your customers fall into what psychologists call the trough of despair, that they are paying somewhere about 35% attention to what's going on. Even if you are doing the most compelling demo, giving the most amazing PowerPoint presentation, it doesn't really matter. So what if there was a way where you could maintain the five to seven minutes at the start, the five to seven minutes at the end, and in the middle, figuratively, put in a heartbeat. That would make quite a difference. So this green area that I have thatched incredibly badly really is additional attention that the customer are paying to you during your sales call. And if the customer pays additional attention to you, that translates into money because they understand you, there's clarity. So if you look at this a little more deeply, in effect, what we're doing is putting a heartbeat into the presentation. 
And the science says the optimal length for that heartbeat is no more than 12 minutes. So that means if you do longer than a 12 minute demonstration without breaking it up, 12 minutes of PowerPoint in a sales situation, or pretty much 12 minutes of anything, the customer is gonna fall into the trough of despair. If however, every 12 minutes, you effectively put virtual shock paddles on the customer, so shock him or her, then your customer is up there paying around 70 or 75% attention, right? because you want to be up in this area, instead of 35% that you're at down here. That's a pretty amazing thing. And this is exactly where whiteboarding comes in. Because one of these little areas here is a perfect place to put in a whiteboard. And the perfect whiteboard is somewhere around six, seven, eight minutes that you deliver with a few questions around it. And it's a fabulous way to gain attention from the customer because it's not PowerPoint and it's not a demo. And I'm gonna leave you with two thoughts on this particular area. First of all, think about who is typically on stage in the middle section. And it is us, DSE, will give us a little flowing cape. So there we are, our hero or heroine. And then secondly, it is a perfect way to grab attention. Think about this, the month of May, how many demos and how many slides do you think your client will have seen in the month of May? And the answer is, yeah, probably a few demos and thousands and thousands of slides, mostly internal, some external. If all you do is the same thing, how do you differentiate yourself? That is the power of the whiteboard and why you should actually do it. Um, so I'm being asked what tool app am I using on my iPad? Uh, I actually have, um, went for it, about nine different apps on my iPad, as you'll see. I'm currently using um, something called Jamboard, which is a Google tool, um, only because that's what I used last week. And we'll dive into this in a little bit more detail um, a touch later. Right, so that is the power of the whiteboard and the reason why you should be using a whiteboard to deliver it. And I'm sure just that chart itself, never mind um, what I actually drew, will generate quite a few comments and uh, questions as we go on a little bit later. So now let's get to the, some, fun, some of the fundamental rules of um, whiteboarding itself. So that was why do it, money and attention. Now we're gonna look at how to do it. So this is a super quick review of a few basic rules and the best practices. And before we start, uh, I'm gonna do a little bit of objection handling up front. And I'll let you read this slide because good presenters do not read their slides. And I'll just give you background. Um, I grew up in the English educational system. Miss Moran was my teacher when I was nine years old. Uh, this is what Miss Moran said about me. So back in the days when uh, you didn't necessarily have to be politically correct. So Miss Moran would be stunned by the fact that about 20, 25% of my company's business is actually taken up by teaching people how to draw boxes and stick figures, but, uh, but there you go. So, not death by PowerPoint. Now, as we go through this, I would actually encourage you to follow along um, as we go. And if you have a piece of paper or even an electronic notepad, uh, you know, please follow along and draw on that. Um, so now here you see a few of the, uh, the items out there. Um, I call it canvas. So no matter what you draw on, it's absolutely uh, canvas. So rule one, probably one of the most important rules, which is why it's rule number one, um, is this one. It's that the board has no money and the customers do. Now, here you see a picture of me in the 
good old days, as it were, um, when doing physical face-to-face -face training. And the basic rule here is that you always want to be looking at the audience when you're not drawing. Uh, or to put that another way, you never want to be drawing and talking at the same time. So we pushed a, techn or a technique called T-cubed, touch, turn, talk, which means that you briefly talk about what you're going to draw, then you draw it, then you physically touch it with your hand, you turn, and you talk more about it. And that works great in the physical world, not so well in the electronic world. So there's a few additional things you need to be aware of if you're doing e-whiteboarding. Um, one is the use of video, um, such as now. Um, so you'll have noticed when I was doing my whiteboard, I actually kept my video on. Uh, and the reason for that is that when I was not drawing, um, I was looking at you, um, making eye contact and actually speaking. This is in direct opposite to what we recommend when you're doing a demo, for example. So if you were doing a virtual demo, we would recommend that you have your camera on when you start. Then when you get to the actual demo itself, you kill your camera. And then when you get to the end of the demo or when you are taking virtual um, Q&A, then you light up your camera again. Um, the reason for that is in the absence of any other stimuli, the eyes naturally go towards looking at faces and not at looking at what else is on the screen. However, with the whiteboard, um, there is still kind of the nonverbal communication that comes along, um, the arm waving and everything else. Uh, so we would encourage you to keep your video on when you are whiteboarding, unless you're suffering from severe bandwidth issues itself. So if we are saying that you never want to be drawing and talking at the same time, that means you need to be aware of the timing behind your whiteboards itself. Um, and we invented a new unit of time called a chunk. Um, and anyone who knows me knows I love to talk about chunks of time. And a chunk is about 10 seconds. So that means when you are drawing, whether it's on a physical whiteboard or on a virtual whiteboard, um, you never want to be drawing for more than about 10 seconds without stopping and speaking and making contact with the customer. Um, because if you go for longer than 10 seconds, all kinds of bad things can happen, right? Um, you know, the customer can tune out, uh, he or she can start doing email, if it run, runs much longer, you know, the sales rep might jump in and say something, uh, none of which are usually good things. So as you start designing your whiteboards, always keep this concept of chunking in mind and you want everything to be done in 10 seconds or less. Um, so that would be the, the recommendation behind that. Now, rule number two is also pretty important. And rule number two is the speed rule. Um, and what this basically says is the number one reason for a messy whiteboard is that you rush. And even though we're engineers, there's this strange kind of time warp thing that goes on when, when we start drawing, we naturally rush. So just a 10% slowdown in terms of your speed and how you write on the whiteboard makes a major, major difference in the neatness and the legibility of your board itself. So you know, let me kind of illustrate that by doing a little bit of sketching here on this board. Um, so now I'm just gonna use the uh, standard zoom capabilities and draw on the board itself. So on one side, I'm just going to very quickly draw my name and my company, and then potentially a couple of symbols. So that's normal whiteboarding speed. If you go about 10% slower, here's what happens. A massive difference in legibility. And the difference between me writing at the top and writing at the bottom is that 10%. It's 7.7 .7 seconds against 8.5 seconds. So when you start whiteboarding, whether you're on a physical whiteboard or on an e-whiteboard, just before you start, take a deep breath, wiggle your toes, um, relax, because the speed you start whiteboarding is the speed that you're normally going to carry on whiteboarding as you go through. So always, always slow down. And at the end, look at what you've drawn and ask, is that your best work? Um, this is a technique that my wife, who 
teaches 10, 11 year olds here in the United States uses when kids hand in their homework. And she'll look at the homework and if she doesn't think it's very good, she'll hand it back and say, Simon, Susie, is this your best work? And normally they'll kind of drop their head and look at the ground and say, no, Mrs. Kerr, it's not. And they'll take it back and go do something else. So your whiteboard is a professional extension of yourself. Um, but to go into rule three, nothing you draw is ever gonna hang in the Louvre. And that's really important. So what that means is iconize. So we'll clear this board here and iconize. Anybody can draw a few boxes and a couple of lines on a whiteboard and start talking about it. That's no big deal. However, if you draw something and then iconize it, it makes a major, major difference in terms of memory. There are two pathways that go into the brain, even mine. Uh, there's a textual pathway and a visual pathway. Uh, and it's that old saying, right? a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, if you light up both the textual pathway, i.e. I write tank here, and then draw a picture of the tank, then it is a tank and no one cares. The general guideline is if you draw something, it only needs to be about 20% of what it looks like in real life. Then if you tell your audience what it is, it is that for the rest of the presentation. So the unwritten part of rule three is go Hollywood or go Bollywood and have some fun with your icons, go into true Looney Tune mode and just practice drawing things. Um, so you know, one of the things that I draw is draw it over here, this fella. So underneath rule three, iconize, you see Mr. Do Job. Um, and many people tell me this is one of the most amazing things they ever get out of their classes because they take this home and they teach it to their children. So you write the letters D-O-J-O-B and at the top, you complete it. At the bottom, you complete it. You put in a little smile draw some hair and you have your very own Dilbert. Um, does that look like anybody in real life? Yeah, not that much, but it's a, just a great way to symbolize somebody as opposed to writing a box and just putting DBA in it. Um, if you're a database administrator, how would you want to be represented? So rule three is iconize, have fun, go Hollywood. And it's a great way to have your client remember what you're actually typing. Okay. Um, other things now about colors. General scheme for colors. Black is the default. It is the current state. So if in doubt, you want to draw something in black. Then you move on to green. And green is the future state. Um, so it is how, you know, if you walk your customer into the future, what is it actually going to look like? So I'm just killing my diagram here. Here we go. Then we have red. Um, oh, so green also here in the United States is the color of money, not necessarily true everywhere else. And green also stands for eco-friendly. Then we have red. Um, Red is the color you normally use for pain or problems. Um, you can also use it to illustrate the competition. Uh, however, be aware of who your competition is. Uh, for example, if you're competing against uh, IBM, um, you never put stuff in blue. If you're competing against Oracle, you'd never put stuff in red. Um, and then red can also be considered in some parts of Asia a lucky color, so you wanna be aware of that. Uh, lastly, we have blue. Um, and blue stands for facts, figures, or authority. So if you kind of think of a logical progression of how things work, I'm just gonna draw this with the Zoom tool. Um, you might be talking to your customer and they're saying, ah, you know, we have one data center and it's connected to a second data center, right? So notice nothing here is ever gonna draw in the Louvre. So that's current state. So that's being drawn in black. And your customer says, ah, but we have a problem. All 
All right, Siri decided she suddenly wanted to help me. There we go. Hey, Brian, how's the screen look? I can see the two data centers with the red triangle in between. Okay, perfect. And I'll just ignore Siri. Okay, so the customer says red. Um, so red is we have a problem. Then you say, well, wouldn't it be nice if, and we're gonna draw a little cloud over here in green, um, pick the cloud vendor of your choice. Um, psychological note, if it's your cloud, always make sure the cloud is joined up. If it's your competitor's cloud, always leave little gaps in it so it's leaky. Um, you know, people are concerned about security in the cloud. And then lastly, you might say, well, Mr. Customer, if you do that, you might get a 29% reduction in total cost of ownership. So that's the general flow of the colors themselves. Um, black, current state, green future, red, problem, and blue, facts, figures, or authority. Now, you should also be aware of your audience itself. And I see there's a few comments in the chat. Um, somewhere around 8% of the uh, Caucasian male population some form of red green color blindness uh, it's about two percent in african americans and one percent in asians uh, so if that's the case just ditch one of the colors or if you're e-whiteboarding uh, pick another color to substitute in for either red or green um, most clients will tell you if they have an issue around this otherwise everything just appears as as gray um, so the majority of us are trichromatic there's a few people who are dichromatic and actually, we've discovered a research paper that shows about 20% of um, women are quadrochromatic and that they can see four primary colors instead of three, uh, which is a kind of an interesting concept. Um, okay, so let's go on. Um, that tank is just gonna stay there. So now let's start thinking about the electronic whiteboard um, specifically. So there are many, many e-whiteboarding apps out there. Uh, it's certainly not my job to kind of recommend any of them. Uh, as you see here, I have nine on my iPad um, and I use each of them uh, with pretty good regularity. Uh, each and every one of them has pluses and minuses. Uh, plus there's a bunch of pretty cool apps you can use on touchscreen devices as well. Uh, I have a touchscreen laptop here, so I also have a few devices on that. The key to absolutely everything, though, for those of you following along my video and can see me, is having an awesome stylus. Um, no matter what you do, the tools are the most essential. Um, no one over the age of 10 should be allowed to draw anything on a whiteboard with either their mouse or even their finger. So you always want to make sure you have a stylus, uh, whether it's a you know, stylus like this that I use on the iPad, and then this is the, uh, the other form of stylus I use here on my touchscreen device. Uh, this is the reason why quad A batteries are in short demand right now. Everyone's buying them for their, their stylus. Um, so you also need to experiment. Um, so there's a few things that you can experiment with and actually understand the tool itself. The first one is that almost every single whiteboarding app gives you the capability to sketch and draw on it much as I have. So there's no reason why, and this is you know, a little bit of cheating, there's no reason why you can't put a slide up, and I just picked this slide randomly off the, the internet, because uh, I didn't want to be in favor of any one particular vendor, and then you can start drawing things on the slide itself. Um, so you know, here you've got your relational database, here you've got your NoSQL database from Couchbase or Mongo or somebody like that. Um, so you can always draw and add things to a slide. Um, this is a great way to do some interactive design with a customer if you don't want to go full um, collaboration. Uh, it's also a good discovery prompt as well if you're trying to go through technical discovery, uh, understand what products they're using, speeds and feeds and everything else. Um, so don't be afraid to have a special slide in your deck specifically designed for you just to be able to like, scribble and put stuff on. Now, I also have clients who specifically put in a blank slide, either a blank white slide or a black slide, and then draw on that so they can do a little bit of freehand within the um, virtual delivery tool itself. You know, so we're using Zoom right now, and Zoom has some fairly neat annotation capabilities built into it, so it's certainly worth experimenting and practicing with that. Um, 
Now, we're also going to look at a second um, tool as well. So I am now going to stop sharing here again, Brian, um, and share content on my screen once more. Yeah, we can see. Hey, look at that. All right, awesome. Hey. Um, so as I said, I am currently using Jamboard um, for no other reason uh, other than this is what I was actually using last week. So it just happens to be lit up. However, one of the things you do need to be aware of, though, is you know, what are the actual capabilities that you have within the tool of choice? So you want to practice and experiment with those. Um, so for example, here I've learned that I can have different backgrounds uh, within the board. So I can set myself a slightly darker background and have it lined if I want to. Over here, I have a tools menu. So this enables me to pick a whole bunch of different colors and different sizes on the pen. And then um, I have assistive drawing tools. So you know, I spent a little bit of time playing with those. And I've discovered that if I want this particular app to recognize my handwriting, I need to write things in kind of lowercase semi cursive. And then it picks up handwriting. So, you know, that's a useful thing. Um, most apps also have built-in shape recognition. So you don't have to worry about too much neatness on the shapes. And then I can move this around and space it out um, as and when I wish. Also pinch things in and out. And then lastly in this, there is also some assistive drawing technology too. So I can draw a box. And that then becomes a building. Um, I can draw something over here. And then I can have a comet about to hit the building. And that might give me an awesome reason to start talking about disaster recovery. So uh, messing around with the tool um, is kind of interesting as well. And there's no reason why you shouldn't um, be able to use this. So I am using um, Jamboard again. Um, and again, this is no, not a recommendation. It's just where I have nine different tools on my iPad and about another six on my device. This is just what I was using last week. It's kind of a goes with the trade. Um, there's also a few other cool things in here too. Um, so practically every device has the capability to have sticky notes. Um, so I can have a sticky note and just type in cloud. And then that is a way of labeling. I can shrink that a little bit. Um, label that up there. Um, that can also be um, a transparent sticky note. So you don't even get to see that. And then um, I can also pull things in from other areas. Uh, I have the capability to grab stickers. So I can drop those in. If I want to highlight something, um, I have the capability to do that. And then uh, because this is actually a Google tool, uh, it has the capability to do some searches as well. So I can find a print of whatever, the Golden Gate Bridge and drop icons in. Um, this also means that if you have particular icons um, that you use within a standard whiteboard, there's no reason why you can't have those icons stored as like JPEGs on a drive somewhere and pull them in. General rule of thumb is as long as you do a bit of the drawing, then it is no big deal in terms of um, what you draw and how you actually draw it. So the message out of this is learn to experiment with the tool, um, understand uh, the pluses, the minuses, if there is assisted drawing technology built within the tool, um, experiment with it. Uh, it's fairly consistent. If you draw the same shape multiple times, um, you will actually get something useful out of it. Um, you know, so I was messing around with this with my granddaughter and I discovered if you draw something that's got four legs and kind of a head and a tail, and then you can get all kinds of animals out of it. Um, so iconization, draw something 20% recognizable and the tool will fill it in. Um, definitely not something that happens on a physical whiteboard, but it's certainly one of the benefits of e-whiteboarding. Um, so would totally encourage you to play around with the tool or hopefully several tools of your choice uh, and then work with it from there. 
Okay, so now I am going to go back to my main screen. We got it. Yep. And away we go. All right, awesome. Okay, so that was. Um, part two, how to do it. So now we're going to go to part three, which are next steps and other resources. And actually, I am going to give you some homework. So if what we've just covered here very briefly kind of lights you up and you wish to learn more, um, there are certainly another places to do this. So I would say, first of all, pick a whiteboard tool or a couple of whiteboard tools out there. So I have about three or four that I use quite regularly. Um, then choose an idea for a whiteboard delivery. Um, my recommendations would be, um, think about a couple of slides that you typically deliver that are just truly horrible. Um, you know, there are typical product management, heat seeking missile for complexity slide. And maybe you want to do a simpler version of it and sketch that out. Um, a question that you are always being asked about your portfolio that maybe you can answer visually. A competitive differentiator between you and one of your rivals. Um, the overall big picture, how everything works in your company put together. Uh, a common user story or use case. Any of these are great examples to build a whiteboard around. So it's not always solution design. Uh, it can just be simple solution presentation. Once you've got the idea, um, sketch it out and then practice delivering it at least three times. Uh, and that way you get the cadence, you get the flow. And then record yourself delivering it, uh, both sound and video then record or review that recording. Right? So review the recording and also ask a friend to look at it as well. And you want to look at the recording three times. First time, listen to it and don't watch the video. And that way you pick up interesting things that really aren't even related to a whiteboard, such as filler words and your general cadence. Then watch yourself present it, but don't have the sound on. And that way you get the other input stream and then lastly watch your watch both streams together both the sound and the video so for an eight minute whiteboard you have to commit 25 minutes to get feedback from it but it's a fabulous way to do it it's quite possibly some of the best um, feedback that you're ever going to get once you've done that grab a second idea build up a second whiteboard and then wash rinse and repeat um, the best se's in the world have at least a dozen standard whiteboards that they can just reel out and draw up on a screen and riff and move from one whiteboard to another to another, all using that seven, eight, nine minute vignette process. A few other resources just to close up here. Um, obviously, I would encourage you to visit the Mastering Technical Sales website. Uh, we also have classes on this. We do custom for particular clients. Uh, there are resources on the website. Uh, there's a guy out there called Dan Rome who's written some fabulous books about visual selling, uh, such as Back of the Napkin, I would recommend, and blah, blah, blah. So check that out as well. And then lastly, just Google um, visual selling and whiteboarding, and you will see a ton of resources as well. And with a little bit of practice, uh, you can just very quickly in six or seven minutes draw something like this. Um, so not too hard. So the last word. Uh, remember, nothing you draw is ever going to hang in a Louvre. However, it's not whiteboard. Um, even if you just inject seven minutes of whiteboard in a 60 minute sales call, it is one of those heartbeats and is a great way to get the customer's attention, differentiate yourself, and as a sales engineer, give yourself some amazing credibility because you have drawn it and it's not something that some product management person back in corporate, uh, particularly if you were outside of the US, has created and put on a slide deck. So I'd leave you with a thought of you know, have some fun, get out there and close some deals. Uh, Brian, um, although I say we should never ever finish with Q&A, this is an educational system and not a sales setting. So uh, yeah. what do we got? Perfect. We got lots of questions. Uh, we have a few minutes to finish it up. For those that we aren't able to get to, John, is there a way for them to connect with you with some of those questions? 
Um, yeah, so, you know, if they just go visit the website, um, they can connect with me there, or they can write to me at john at masteringtechnicalsales.com. Perfect. So the first question we want to jump into uh, is a question about when you would use a uh, uh, an approach like this as opposed to just doing a demo within the system, or what are some of the rules you have behind doing a whiteboard versus showing something inside of a demonstration of the product? Sure. For those people who are following me on Twitter right now, um, thank you. I'm getting all the notifications. <laughs> Uh, so here you see an example of me rushing and trying to write John at marshingtechnicalsales.com. So the question is, when should you do this? Um, I think the answer is, if you're trying to make a transition maybe from doing a demo to a slide deck, or that you are trying to explain um, something that is more custom for a client. So although you can do some customization in a demo, it's really hard to do some on-the-fly customization in a PowerPoint. So if a customer says, how would that work in my situation? I don't have those, you know, I don't have those firewalls. I have these firewalls instead. How's it gonna work? Um, if you start sketching something on a slide, um, it is amazing. And then if the customer, you know, chips in and draw something as well, suddenly it's a collaborative solution and magic happens. So where possible, I would encourage you to just put just a tiny bit of visual selling into a call and you'll be amazed at the, just the humanization and the interaction it would drive. That's great. So there's quite a few respondents or questions here that fall in the same boat as I do and they have terrible handwriting. Uh, so a lot of questions are asking if using typed words is acceptable in a whiteboarding situation. Uh, yes, it is. Um, now, I would also say that 10% slower rule does actually apply. So, for example, if I go back to my slide here, and you know, I now write John Farnita at the top right, um, it does make a difference. But no, almost all the whiteboarding tools will do text recognition, or you can create labeling and just type something into the keyboard, and that, that is perfectly acceptable. Um, in fact, if you're smart, you might have some of those already pre-designed. Great. A really good question from Dustin on rule number three. Uh, in your experience, would you suggest drawing the tank and then writing tank or vice versa, which gives the customers the best retention of what that symbol represents? <laughs> oh, always draw it um, and then see if they get it and then, then write the, uh, the words in. It's, uh, it's far more fun. Um, yeah, I, I've, yeah, I, I've whiteboarded, you know, to a group of 30 highly, highly technical people up to folks like, you know, Larry Ellison, Mark Hurd, um, Benny Off and uh, high level ranking Chinese bureaucrats. And if you just have a little bit of fun with iconization, it really loosens people up. So uh, always, always draw it and then see if they can guess it before you label it. That's great. I love it. Uh, so a really good question from Andrew. Do you find it to be effective to collaborate on e-whiteboards live with clients? And if so, do you have any tools that make that easy to do? Um, yes. So I do find it very effective. The same way in the physical world, you would hand a pen to a client and say, how does that work in your environment? Uh, I would you know, in totally encourage you to do the same if your clients are willing to do that kind of collaboration um, because as soon as they touch pen to paper or e-paper you now have a joint solution and just by itself um, that can take you one stage further in the cell cycle um, so always collaborate um, again it's not my place to recommend tools uh, i have 250 three clients, I think, within Mastering Technical Sales. So some of them create these tools. I would get in trouble if I did. Um, with a little bit of research and you can find one that fits you and your company. That's great. So when you're using multiple tools like you did during this presentation where you have your desktop and then your iPad, do you have any recommendations on transitioning or things to talk about or what to do in those transitions to make them as fluid as possible? Uh, uh, I, I always talk. Uh, whilst I am transitioning, um, and I'm, I, I might be, you know, to use the literary term, foreshadowing what's coming next. Um, so I always give myself at least a 15 or 20 second talk track that I can use as I'm transitioning from, for example, from Zoom into um, to my iPad and back again. You don't, you don't ever want to say, let's go over to the iPad, and then you get complete silence for 15 or 20 seconds. Um, so, I like that. That makes sense. Yeah. So, so ho ho hopefully, you know, I continue to just, you know, lay, lay on the BS while I was switching from one, uh, one session to another. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. 
Uh, so what are your thoughts about reusing a drawing to save time and essentially just having those uh, available to throw onto the whiteboard? Uh, if, if they're a base or it shows that you've done a little bit of research about the client, um, I think that's okay. It's the same principle as having you know, a slide and annotating on top of a slide. Um, you do always want to draw something though, because again, there's incredible credibility from you sketching something and drawing something and it makes it personal. Um, you know, it's the, there's a lot to be said for personalization and showing the customer that you care about them and that you've, you've listened to them and you're putting, you know, putting into effect what you've heard from them potentially in discovery. So uh, if you just go in with something pre-programmed, you lose a bit of that impact. So you, know, you always, always want to draw something, but if you have you know, anywhere from 10% to 60 or 70% of it already done, no, that's okay. That's great. We had a few questions ask what the highlight loop tool you were using during the presentation is. Oh, this thing? Yeah. Yeah, look at that beautiful face. Uh, yeah. This this is called a Logitech Spotlight. Um, so it's a you know, device you can buy directly from Logitech or online. Um, it's not the cheapest thing in the world. It costs about 70 US dollars. Uh, however, what it does is as well as acting as a standard slide marker, um, it allows you to highlight areas. And then if you want to, I won't do that on this face, um, it allows you to magnify as well. So this is awesome if you're doing demos, right? Um, because you know, if you're doing something on a demo and you're trying to show what your mouse is doing up in the top left-hand corner, um, you can do that. There are other tools out there. Um, you know, there's, there's some stuff particularly built into uh, Mac OS that allows you to do that. But in general, I found this works across pretty much every single virtual device on almost every single piece of hardware. So uh, it's pretty cool. Again, it's called a Logitech Spotlight. Oh, that is a really cool tool. Thanks, John. That's yeah. awesome. So final question, and then we'll have to have the rest reach out directly. Um, but we had a question on when using actual physical whiteboards, do you ever use a straight edge or any other uh, tool to help assist you in your drawing? Um, um, no, I actually don't. The, the secret to drawing straight lines on a physical whiteboard is you need to draw from the shoulder as opposed to drawing from the wrist. And you always want to draw away from you as opposed to towards you. If you draw a line coming towards you, uh, just the way the shoulder joint works, it kind of drops and tails off. If you draw away from you, um, the way your eyes handle perspective, you stand a much better chance of getting a horizontal line. The vertical line, gravity is your friend, always go from top to bottom. Well, perfect, John. We, again, greatly appreciate your time uh, in this session today, and thanks everyone for joining. Let's chat some claps for John and uh, some of the great information he was able to share with us today. Uh, just as a quick reminder, coming up in our next sessions, we have the eight strategies for scaling pre-sales with uh, Garen Hess. And in track two, we have acting tips for connecting on camera with Julie Hansen. So take a look in your email inboxes. You should have the direct invites for those. Uh, if you can't find that, you can always visit demofest2020.com. That's demofest2020.com to find an invite to be able to make it to those sessions. And we look forward to seeing you there. Thanks everyone for joining and have a great rest of your day. Okay, thank you. Dankeschön to everybody. I saw we have the Germans here. <laughs>